Good evening, this is NRTV Main News with me, Mahmoud Khan, and these are the stories making headlines tonight. Political parties react to by-election proclamation. Tobacco planting season preps progressing well, says TIMB. And in sport, Highlanders seeks to bounce back to winning ways. And now let's take a look at these stories in detail. Following the declaration of vacant seats in Parliament by the Speaker Advocate Mudenda as a result of the recall of 14 legislators, President Munangagwa proclaimed the 9th of December as polling day for the by-elections. However, political parties have responded differently to the proclamation. President Mnangagwa proclaimed the 7th of November as the date of the nomination court and the 9th of December as the by-election date. The by-elections which have been necessitated by the recall of 14 CCC legislators have been welcomed by the ruling ZANU-PF party. As ZANU-PF, we always relish uh, participation in a democratic uh, process. Well, from the date of elections to date, I'm sure the people of Zimbabwe have seen which party is serious and which party is not serious with uh, the wealth of Zimbabweans. He went on to say that the party looks forward to a win. So we're really looking forward to these by-elections because this is going to be a chance for the people to give the uh, opposition a wake-up call to stop uh, childish politics, to stop uh, politics which, uh, without maturity, which has got no beginning and no end. And uh, the people are going to remind the opposition that uh, the reason they voted in is to serve the people. Ever since the election, they've not done anything. They've just been... Uh, making noise, causing distractions, but they've not done anything with uh, the mandate that they've been given. So this will be a prime opportunity for ZANU-PF to reassert itself. However, opposition parties have not welcomed the proclamation of the by-election, with the main opposition putting out a press statement saying that they have not recorded any party member and that the party does not have such a position as Secretary-General, a statement which was echoed earlier this week. We mandated President Chamisa to write to the Speaker of Parliament and inform the Speaker, Honorable Mudenda, that we have acted in error, that the current person who wrote to you does not represent our movement. And the Speaker has given us a response that the issue has been subjected to the courts and we await uh, the pros court processes that are happening. The statement goes on to say that the Citizens Coalition for Change will explore all available solutions to avoid going through another election. Meanwhile, the National Constitutional Assembly has condemned the by-election. We don't believe that it was a time to go back to an election for whatever reason. We must only have by-elections if there is a death, someone has died, and that's unavoidable, or if someone has resigned. I think we condemn first the constitutional clause that allows a, a political party to recall a person who has been elected by the people. We all know that those people who are asked to vote again do not know why they are voting again. Professor Maduku added that his party will not participate. We are not participating in those particular elections, especially. We are actually condemning. We were in those constituencies a month ago. Yeah. And we don't want to go to those constituencies now unless there is a good reason someone has died. If we were to be part of the process of someone, there's a recall, whatever it is called, and then we are in the, in the by-election and so on, we are promoting what we are condemning. Though the National Constitutional Assembly will not participate in the by-election, Professor Maduku is confident of a win in the Gutu West constituency race. And then we have a very good confidence that we win in, uh, in, in Gutu West. Why should we not win uh, ZANU-PF? has been elected in the other constituencies. There's nothing to add. Why would anyone still add more than a pair of people? PJ Nagoli, NRTV News in Harare. The government, through the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructural Development, has completed and opened to traffic 460 kilometers of the Harare Bight Bridge Road. The construction of the road, which is part of the Emergency Road Rehabilitation Program, has thus far been a team effort of at least six corporations, namely Bitumen, Fossil, Tenso, Exodus, Masimba Construction, and DOR, who have been part of the construction. Meanwhile, following his victory in the concluded August plebiscite,
President Mnangagwa has a good number of female appointments, a move that has been welcomed by the ZANU-PF Women's League. Let's get more from the following story. The ZANU-PF Women's League has commended President Mnangagwa for appointing female leaders into key positions in government. The Women's Affairs Secretary was speaking at the Women's League 7th National Assembly. Special gratitude goes to His Excellency the President for appointing women to strategic positions, affording women an, oppo an, an opportunity to prove their weight. We look forward to more female appointments and commit to roll out programs that support, promote, groom, and inspire more women, working with an ambitious target of being the number one leading country in the percentage representation of women in strategic and leading decision making positions. Baba Jinomona, who is also the Senate president, went on to urge the women in the party to be unified as this will help in furthering their agenda. Let us form a formidable front and wait for the advancement and empowerment of women in all spheres. President Mnangagwa has made key female appointments in his government following his victory in the just-ended August plebiscite, a move that has been welcomed by the female wing of the ruling party. P.J. Nagoli, NRTV News, in Harare. Broad alliance against sanctions has reached a momentous milestone in the ongoing protest outside the U.S. Embassy. For an incredible 1,669 days, they have remained steadfast in their demonstration against the economic sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe. We give you more in the following report. What everyone needs to understand is that um, this fight against sanctions is, um, it is an economic warfare. It's a war. So we don't expect everything to be rosy and everything to be nice. Um, when we started camping here, we didn't even have tents. Um, we surpassed the rains, we surpassed the colds, we surpassed the heat when we didn't even have uh, a roof over our head. Because what we are trying to achieve is that at the end of the day, the Americans, since they call themselves the masters of human rights, uh, they will understand our plight as ordinary citizens of Zimbabwe. Do you think that uh, this demonstration or this war against the American people is actually working because you've been here for four years. Have you been seeing any changes since you started camping here? Well, I think it's actually working uh, because uh, the previous ambassador even told us that he was having sleepless nights with him coming to work every day and people demonstrating outside his embassy. Um, we saw them removing some state-owned institutions from the sanctions list like Agribank and uh, Infrastructure Development Bank. Uh, we even saw America um, removing some penalties which they had put on some of our banks, like uh, is it ZB Bank and CBZ. So that shows that whatever that the people of Zimbabwe are doing with the um, engagement and re-engagement being done by the government or the demonstrations that are being done by us as the civic society, it means that it's working. Have you had any formal interactions with the American embassy or is it just you doing the demonstrations outside the embassy? Well, we have had several engagements with the American government and um, they have their reasons for maintaining sanctions, which of course to us as ordinary citizens, we see them as now and void. We see them as trying to hide uh, behind a finger because they will tell us that uh, they are maintaining sanctions uh, against Zimbabwe because um, there is no peace in Zimbabwe. Yet we all know that Zimbabweans are peace-loving people and we have enjoyed peace for a very long time. Maybe Zimbabwe is even more peaceful than America. Stay with us for more news. Good fun. 
When it comes to edutainment, here's TV's number one. Is everybody ready to go, go, go? We've got the zaniest characters to transport you away. The party is cracking, so why not come play? You're gonna love it. We've got so many channels and a ton of new shows, like Disney and Nickelodeon, where anything goes. <laughs> so live it up with DSTV. We bring the fun. You know we're number one. <laughs> School. It is with deep sadness that we received a phone call this morning informing us that um, one of our students. When I go around, I was like, I'm going I usually get paid to talk, but these words come for free and straight from the heart. Poachers are killing more than three rhinos every day. Our national parks are becoming war zones and people are dying too. I care, and I know you care too. We don't want your money, we want your voice. Ask our leaders to do more to fight wildlife crime. And together, we can save our rhinos. Because poaching steals from us all. Mopenyu, umwane umwane norondo yake. Norondo zebu, zino tangira kwa kasi ya nasi ya. Mkufamba jiraya upenyu, tunusangana netepi netepi zewana. Weda type it soto, means good or bad. Mwarindi ya nasi. Manager, my crops, and my flowers.
Welcome back. Following the arrest of two notorious armed robbers who had been terrorizing the cities of Harare, Bulawayo and Mutare, the two, Israel Zulu and David Takawira, attempted to escape from police custody before being shot dead after being taken to South Lee Park, the area where they were alleged to have hidden the firearms. We give you more in the next report. The two are believed to have been the same robbers that stole from various homes and in some instances left people dead. Let's hear more from the National Police Spokesperson Assistant Commissioner Ponyati on this matter. These robberies were facing several counts of armed robbery cases, which include the one at a company in Mount Pleasant, where U.S. three hundred sixty-two thousand cash and uh, several uh, thousands of Zim dollars were taken. Uh, we also had, uh, they had a case in Belvedere where they killed uh, an old man, an Indian man, and attacked several family members uh, before walking away with uh, thousands of US dollars and cell phones. And they had other several cases in Mutare, in Harare, in Blawayo, in Mash Central. So we had the detectives taking them to the scene and they tried to take advantage of the weather. You know that uh, since Monday it has been raining and uh, the detectives removed leg irons and cuffs to allow them to show the police where they had hidden the firearms, firearms which they were using to commit robbery cases. Sadly, they then uh, tried to run away and uh, there was a shootout leading to the unfortunate death of the suspects. The constant occurrences of these incidents is becoming worrisome. Since the beginning of this year, more than five cases involving shootouts have been reported in Mudiriro Kaudri Park, in Keta Weza, and now in South Lee Park, near Manyame River. In February this year, accused serial killer, former CID officer Jason Muveve, shot a Weza officer in charge, Max Wehove, to death while others were left in serious wounds in a shootout. Again in August, in Blawayo Country Park, two police officers were left injured after engaged in a shootout with a robber who was hiding in his girlfriend's place. Gabriel Gede, NLTV News. Moving on, following the heavy rains that pounded the country from last weekend into this week, our reporter Alvis Mashauri spoke to wheat farmers to find out harvest prospects. Zimbabwe is targeting a harvest of at least 430,000 tons of wheat from the winter crop. Of achieving the set targets following the early onset of the rains, Zimbabwe received heavy rains in most parts of the country this week, worrying farmers that if this continue would destroy the wheat crop, which was now at the drying stage. Now, our wheat was just getting there to harvesting. So once it's rained on, it affects the, uh, the quality. It becomes undergrade, and uh, you get the lowest price, if at all. Uh, another thing, if the rain is heavy with thunderstorms, hailstorms, then it lies on the ground, you can't harvest it. That is the worst position. We have to grow that wheat. It, it has to be harvested in October, full stop. There's no other way. After October, it rains now serious for the summer crop. So it's a loss, a big loss to the farmers. They may not be able to pay off their loans. I come from uh, Makoni district, especially the headlands area. 
we people were posting to Agritex to say what hexage had been affected and I counted up to 200 hectares. Another farmers union, the Zimbabwe Commercial Farmers Union, is advising that the wheat farmers should speed up the harvesting process. We encourage farmers to hasten that is the harvesting speed or to quicken the pace in which they are harvesting their wheat. We have enough combined harvesters, so there is no end reason why wheat farmers should be found wanting. They should take advantage of uh, the window period where we've got sunshine because days are dwindling. We are talking of probably now remaining with the seven days or so. So wheat farmers should work day and night so that at least they should remove their wheat from the fields, lest they will suffer uh, the consequences of uh, the rains and the loss will be high. Statistics from the Ministry of Lands and Agriculture indicated that more than 200 hectares were affected by the heavy rains, but further assessments will be carried out. Elvis Mashore, Renault TV News, Arad. Still in court and crimes, Gabriel Gede gives us our court roundup. An employee of a local fast food restaurant, Tapiwa Jongo, was directed to court on Friday on robbery allegations. He was denied bail by Arare Street Marewa Nazogofa and remanded in custody until November 23rd. According to the allegations, the accused, along with his accomplices, who were still at large, attacked Onyas Goto, who had offered them a lift from Ziko Seke to other parts of Chitungwiza. They allegedly assaulted him, tied his hands and legs together, and dumped him in a train in Mayambara village. However, Goto managed to untie himself and quickly made a police report. The accused individuals then fled with Goto's motor vehicle and his phone, which eventually led to their discovery. On another matter, a 23-year-old man was dragged to court on Friday on allegations of attempted murder. Daniel Kachiza is accused of assaulting the complainant with an iron bar multiple times on the head after becoming angered by the complainant's failure to repay a debt resulting in a serious injury. He was remanded in custody out of concern that he might interfere with the witness, as ruled by Harare Street Marewana Zogova. Gabriel Gede in our TV. In our arts segment tonight, we feature Anesu Membere, popularly known as Minister of White Linen, who has emerged as a prominent figure in the fashion industry, driven by his passion for fashion. His unique sense of style and innovative approach to design have made waves and garnered attention from fashion enthusiasts around the world. His distinct style and fashion-forward designs have set him apart in the industry. He is known for his daring choices and ability to push boundaries, creating garments that are both avant-garde and commercially appealing. He is a fashion um, showbiz and events consultancy company. Let me start off with one of the brands that we are known for, Minister Portland itself, um, a celebrity stylist and a fashion practitioner. Under this brand, we give our clients styling services. Whether you are an executive, a CEO, an artist, a musician, bride, groom, um, an event, event attendee, anybody who needs styling services, you do not know how to put your office together, you need advice or fashion expertise as far as putting an outfit together. The Minister of White Linen's Designs have captured the attention of fashion enthusiasts. His collections have been showcased at prestigious fashion events and have received acclaim for their creativity and originality. I also just want to be curious uh, in terms of what the kind of outfit I do have on me today. Um, I'm a very vibrant um, RC person um, because people have got different, different um, personal styles. My personal style is vibrant and artsy, so I, I love the popping colors, I love the reds, the greens, the shouting colors, and today I'm in green as you can see. Um, I'm wearing green pants and a blazer, but I accessorized it with a sachet that is on my shoulder and just a basic white shirt to give it, to tone it down a little bit. Um, and, and the sachet has been my trademark 
and, and I use this piece on a lot of artists and a lot of clients that come to me. It's like that one thing that says Minister of what Linen was here. Um, and, 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 and green is one of my favorite colors because it represents nature um, and it just makes me feel alive when I, wear, when I wear green. Not that it's my favorite color, blue is, but I also um, just like experimenting with, um, with other outfits. And you can also wear this outfit when you're going for a red carpet event, uh, when you're going for a wedding, church, definitely a church, um, anything that is... is NRL TV News, Harare. In news from beyond our borders, the National Museum of Women in Arts in Washington, D.C. reopened to the public on the 21st of October after a two-year and a $70 million renovation. We give you more in the next report. After two years of work expanding the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C., the renovated museum reopened in the nation's capital on October 21st. The museum has been made more accessible for people with disabilities, the exhibition halls are more spacious, and the museum's showpiece collection has grown by some 40 percent. There are now about 600 artifacts and masterpieces, including the famous Frida Kahlo's self-portrait. Catherine Watt, the museum's chief curator, says the museum is showcasing the work of modern female artists. We are reopening with a special exhibition called The Sky's the Limit, which is about women sculptors who work at a very bold scale and with an incredible array of materials that will be on view until the end of February. And then throughout the year, we're presenting a new exhibition in our collection galleries called Remix, which is um, nine thematic groupings of both historical and contemporary works of art from the collection. Visitors can see the famous chandelier by Portuguese artist Joana Vasconcelos. There is the pregnant Nana sculpture done by French-American sculptor Niki de Saint-Fal, who is also famous for the Stravinsky Fountain work outside of the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Susan fisher Sterling is the museum's director. Women are really far away from achieving parity or equality in the art world. And so the museum's mission in some ways is more important than ever. Our hope is that this will continue to the point where we reach gender equity in the arts. But I think that this museum is going to be really critical for keeping the drumbeat going on the importance of thinking about creativity among artists of all genders. According to the art market website Artnet, in the period between 2008 and 2020, the work of women artists made up only one-tenth of all showpieces in American museums. Officials at the National Museum of Women in the Arts hope their work will begin to change that. Karina Bafradjian for VOA News. And now on to Ghana, where overfishing has pushed fish stocks to an all-time low in Ghana's Atlantic coast. The government there has been prompted to put into place regulations aimed at stopping the scourge. Let's hear more in the following report. <laughs> It's another busy morning at the fishing harbor in Tema, just outside Ghana's capital, Accra. Fishermen like Yasiel Arafat Ali say this year is the worst in a long string of bad years. What we have seen this year is quite different from all, the, all, all over the years. Though we still see our problems for about 15, 20 years back, but this particular year was a very mess. The small fish that are a cornerstone of the Ghanaian diet are getting harder and harder to find. If care is not taken, um, the artisanal fishery will certainly collapse. In actual fact, it is on the verge of you know, imminent collapse. Nana Jojo Solomon heads the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council, the association representing the artisanal fishermen. He says they know their catches and their livelihoods are at risk. So new government regulations are mostly welcome. I think government is now focusing you know, on the industry as against the total neglect in the past years. It comes back to so many canoes chasing after very few uh, stock of fish that we have. And that is the challenge that we want to, as much as possible, try to control now. Richard Yaboa heads enforcement for Ghana's Fisheries Commission. He says the government closes the ports for a month each year to help the fish populations recover. 
and it recently put a cap on the number of fishing canoes. Too much of everything is bad. So the idea of the government is good to minimize the canoes. Fishermen like Ashtai Ishmael approve, but they say the bigger problem is illegal fishing by Chinese trawlers. Even if we are reduce it in a certain number and still the, uh, uh, the trawlers are doing what they are doing, it's meaningless. To a large extent, the trawlers have um, their portion of the blame. Yes, definitely they are, they are contributing to um, the illegal fishing activities. Yaboa says that's why a new electronic monitoring system will soon keep watch on the trawlers. All the vessels that will be given license to fish, they are all going to have the videos on them. You agree with me that videos are such that um, you, can, you can't hide from, from it if you are conducting illegality and you are caught. But he says the small-scale fishermen are part of the problem too. Some of them we hear they are also using dynamite. Um, and then some of them, recently we hear that some of them are even using detergents also uh, to fish. So when you look at the fleet that we have, from the artisanal through to the industrial, they all have a part to play as far as illegalities are concerned. There are glimmers of hope that the government's measures are helping fish populations recover. But it will take years to know if more is needed. That means more tough years ahead for Ghana's fishermen. Up next, we look at business news. Service with USSD, making your life easy. Get down with USSD and dial star 899 hash to pay your account, fix errors, upgrade packages and a whole lot more. Unlock USSD self-service in just five moves. As a comedian, my job is to stand up here and make you laugh, so here goes. A poacher and a rhino walk into a deep, dark forest together. The poacher says to the rhino, hey, big nose, why are you looking so nervous? I'm the one who's gonna have to walk out of here on my own. Tough crowd, tough situation. Because killing rhinos is not funny, it's terrible. And right now, we are facing a poaching crisis like never before. Hundreds of rhinos dying, and people too. So please, ask our leaders to do more to fight wildlife crime. We don't want your money, we want your voice. Because poaching steals from us all.
amesi jano ja to the fullest tipa no pa hot springs tipa no buda mvura ino pisa rambai muchiona nr tv pa dstv channel 288 oyo Central business district has become jammed with traffic and crammed by vendors and that's contributed to a flight of corporates from the city now those tenants have been the traditional bread and butter of institutional commercial real estate developers so how are they coping given the circumstances and crucially what do they see as the way forward to addressing the challenge welcome to the focus my name is Farai Mwakutuya join me as we delve deeper NRTV is your brand new hottest television station and we are eager to partner with you in taking your brand beyond your imagination. Our young and vibrant approach to the broadcasting game gives us the unique edge. With our wide-reaching platform on DSTV, we ensure that your adverts reach your desired audience and leave a lasting impression. With flexible packages, you are free to set the format and length of advertisement that suits your organization. It truly is advertising made easy. So don't let anything hold you back from getting your brand recognized. Contact the NRTV marketing team on our email, marketing at nrtv.tv. As the 2023-2024 farming season beckons, the Tobacco Industry Marketing Board has said farmers are preparing well for the planting season. Alvis Mashauri gives us more. Statistics from the Tobacco Industry Marketing Board indicate that the irrigated tobacco seeds are progressing well and they are targeting to cover over 140,000 hectares. The tobacco regulator has indicated that there is an increase of the planted tobacco for this coming season compared to last season. The amount of seed beds planted, if they're all transplanted, will give us 150,000 hectares. But that's a very, very um, inadequate indicator. But it's the best indicator we've got for now. I can't remember what it was last year, but the irrigated crop that's already been transplanted is 16,000 hectares compared to 14,000 hectares last year. While farmers are appreciating the early rain, the Tobacco Industry Marketing Board is also aware of the, that this coming season will be affected by the El Nino phenomenon. I would think, unless it's been torrential and, and sort of washed away and, uh, you know, getting run, uh, topsoil run away, I think it's good for tobacco. Sadly, it's not good for the wheat that's ready to be harvested. But for tobacco, I don't see it as a problem. It's nice to have some moisture in the soil. I would say that's unlikely. We are very positive about the forthcoming season. Uh, but don't forget, last year was an absolutely perfect season. The rains came at the right time, the crop grew well, everything worked well. This year we have the threat of El Nino, although look here, October, we've already had 70 plus or minus mills. So sometimes El Nino brings, brings a wetter season. Last year the country produced a record of 298 kilograms of the leaf compared to 206 kilograms produced in the previous season. Elvis Masari, for NRTV News, Arad. Oil and gas exploration firm Invictus says they have encountered encouraging signs in the second exploratory well they are drilling in the Muzarabani Basin. Invictus Managing Director Scott McMillan said preliminary data has so far shown elevated gas readings, including heavier hydrocarbons. Going forward, Invictus is preparing to drill a further 1,000 meters to the pan planned total depth of 3,750 meters. Once total depth is reached, a comprehensive wireline logging program to evaluate results will follow with the aim of confirming the presence of movable hydrocarbons in multiple zones. 
The well remains on track to being completed in the forecasted period of 50 to 60 days. That was our look at business news. Sports news is up next. Premier League, all on DSTV. All the goals, clashes, and moments. All of Rashford, Salah, and Saka. The start is getting better and better and better. All in HD. It just makes no sense. Available on all these bouquets to choose from. To watch on all these devices. Stay connected for all the action. It's the Premier League, all on DSTV. When you stand alone, you lose. When you stand with your team, you win. Join our team and speak out for Rhinos. Rhino poaching is out of control. We don't want your money. We want your voice. Make a noise about wildlife crime. And together, we can save our Rhinos. Because poaching steals from us all. The show is about dance, it's about Nsengo, it's about entertainment. is not cool. Be cool and say no to illegal bush meat. Because poaching steals from us all. Me na go benda me lele Je suis fond d'amour avec toi Mon cœur ne s'arrête pas C'est juste moi et ma bébé Je suis là pour ma bébé Dis quoi de ma bébé When the buying stop The cooling can too Just a bully, cause in Nairobi we don't want to be such shit. So you know what mosquito does? You can go to my phone, throw it, throw it, see you, see you. If I had friends.
friends they ku bora or rugby. Let us go on and go to what good people say. We are not going to do that. Nana, if you are just friends, and after that, you're like, think what you think. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Time Out with Yvonne. And as usual, we bring you a big sporting personality in Zimbabwe. And now in the exciting world of sport, Highlanders assistant coach Joel Lupahla says it's high time they rediscover their winning formula in the Castle Lager Premier Soccer League. He said this ahead of his side's clash against Bulawayo Chiefs tomorrow at Barberfield Stadium. Boso has gone for a five-match winless run. The last time it won a match was on the 17th of September against Yada Stars. Springing a prize, six games, it might even take 18 points, but we need to start somewhere, and that somewhere we need to make sure that on Sunday. I know Bulawayo Chiefs, they won away, they will come with, with confidence, also. So we also want to take the performance from Greenfield and try and make sure that uh, we correct all the wrongs that have been happening. But in terms of uh, the motivation and everything, I think we as a team culture is a gunning up to make sure that these boys understand also uh, the pressure that uh, is always there playing for Islanders. But we are confident with what we saw that uh, on Sunday we will turn the corner and make sure that we get the three points that we deserve. Football stakeholders in Zimbabwe will have a chance to sit down and discuss business next week courtesy of the Zimbabwe Football Forum Business Forum. Let's hear more in the following report. The second edition of the Southern Africa Football Business Forum is scheduled to take place on the 3rd of next month in the Cape Town. The forum will have local and international football stakeholders. Amongst those is the Premier Soccer League and the Spanish La Liga. Running under the theme Enhancing Regional Cooperation and Structural Integration in Football, the Business Forum is organized by Zimbabwe Football Forum. This is our second uh, Zimbabwe Football Forum. Um, and essentially what we are trying to do as, as of the first, is, is always to drive football business. And most importantly is, is to have an appreciation that um, f sport or football in itself is, is, a, is an industry that has potential to transform societies, potential to actually employ, and potential to transform and contribute to, to the GDP of the country. And um, our push as Zimbabwe Football Forum obviously is, is to have to bring out that appreciation and also ensure that we, we, we take football professionally and be able to to really, really transform and um, improve our, our, our well-being and improve our, uh, our sector as, as, as football. They also added that the business forum comes at an opportune time for local football stakeholders since the country's football is currently going through a rebuilding exercise which is being led by Zifa Normalization Committee which was put in place by FIFA. We have all the football stakeholders in Zim on board and um, we, we, what we're trying to do is bring in all these stakeholders, all these experts in, in one room so that we, we, we try and chart uh, a course for football. And what, what better, what better uh, I mean, time to do it than the, the readmission into, into, um, into the International Football Forum that b gives us an opportunity to really set things into perspective, we have the right governance structures have the, the right systems and policies, and most importantly, be able to market and, and, and uh, grow, grow a brand. And there isn't any other better way of doing it. Uh, like they always say, the cornerstone of every uh, football, um, country's football ecosystem is club football. So we want to be able to, to also bring in, uh, bring in PSL and, um, and so that they get to also interact and form strategic partnerships and collaborations with, with, uh, with La Liga one of the best, if not the best, football league in the world. Football is now one of the channels used to generate profitable income. According to a research, the global football market size reached 3.2 billion in 2022, and economists believe that it will increase by 4% this year.
three-time Rugby World Champions New Zealand yesterday progressed to the finals of the 2023 Rugby World Cup. After beating Argentina 44-6 in a semi-final match, they dominated from start to finish. This is the fifth time that the All Blacks will be playing a Rugby World Cup final, with the last one being in 2015, when they defended the title to become the first team to win it back-to-back. -back. In the final, New Zealand will play the winner between defending champions South Africa and England, who are locking horns tonight in another semi-final match. Let's hear what team head coach Ian Foster had to say after yesterday's victory. Oh, it's everything. It's a goal. You know, we came here want, wanting to be in the final and, and then we obviously want to go and win it. So um, we've given ourselves that opportunity and incredibly proud of the way we backed up tonight. I, I thought it was a tough game. We got asked a lot of questions of us from Argentina early, but held great composure and finished strong. So pretty pleased. And uh, what do you think you did really well tonight from specifically that the team did well to be able to get that control? Because as you said, at different times, it wasn't always there. Yeah, look, I think it's um, semi-finals. There's a lot of pressure on, isn't it? And, you know, Argentina really throw, threw a lot at us early. And I, I just felt we, we stayed in the game. We, we were hanging in there a little bit defensively, but we, we kept our cool, kept control. And, and then when we won the ball, we were able to, to punish them a little bit. So... And, that, and probably that, that three or four minutes before half time was pretty important, those eight points. So it gave us that buffer. From a personal point of view, how satisfying is it for you to be able to get the All Blacks into the last dance? Yeah, no, it's everything. You know, we've, uh, well, I'm, I'm part of a group that's working really, really hard to do that. So uh, really satisfying. But, but now all the pressure of the final comes. So we'll enjoy the moment. But uh, wake up tomorrow and uh, get into work. Meanwhile, Argentina head coach Michael Chica said he was disappointed that they lost the semi-finals to New Zealand, but he believes they can take home the bronze medal if they win in the third and fourth place playoff match. Argentina will play the losing side between South Africa and England, who are facing off tonight. Yeah, incredibly disappointing for us. You know, the effort was huge. Like. They put everything out there, and I think it was just in the details of the game, you know, the small details on transition, in scrums, that last five minutes before, the last couple of minutes before half time, first couple of minutes after half time. They're the little nuances that we don't have as yet um, in our game, but we've certainly got a, um, a lot to be proud of our players about. I know the score is hard, but their effort today and their defence and their, their, their work around the field just didn't have the class, you know, to match, the, uh, the, to match New Zealand. I know it's fresh, but how do you look back on this World Cup with this particular group of players? They're not finished yet. It's not finished yet. We want to go home with a medal. So next week's every, it's huge for us, you know. So um, I'm not sure if you get one for coming third, but I think that's yeah, the way it sort of works. And we'll, we'll have to get over tonight because we we really believe we could get in there and do something and it's going to hurt. But And I want to really thank our fans. You know, sorry it wasn't a bit closer tonight. They've been huge for us and and um, look forward to getting back. I'll well, look forward to next week and seeing them there. And that's all we had for you tonight. But before we go, let's take a look at our headlines once again. Political parties react to by-election proclamation. Tobacco planting season preps progressing well, says TIMB. And in sport, Highlanders seeks to bounce back to winning ways. And that's it from Ima Murakan and the crew behind the scenes. Don't go away, we're bringing you the weather report.